The coronavirus pandemic has created new challenges for businesses as they adapt to an operating model in which working from home has become the new normal. Companies are accelerating their digital transformation, but one of the major concerns that is also rising along with digital transformation is cybersecurity. Hello everyone, welcome back to one more podcast. This is Priya Dialani, your host for today. Now today let's talk about a critical growing aspect in the field of technology. Well, we all know that 2020 broke all records when it came to data loss in breaches and sheer numbers of cyber attacks on companies, government and even individuals. In addition, the sophistication of threats increased from the application of emerging technologies such as machine learning, artificial intelligence and now even 5G. And especially from greater tactical cooperation from hacker groups and state actors. The recent solar winds attack, among others, highlighted both the threat and sophistication of these realities. Now, after hearing all this, how do you see a world in the future? A world full of cyber securities or a world where technology will create a soundproof living? So today with us, we have Mr. Glenn Day, CEO and founder of Envision X, a leading SaaS cybersecurity company who will share views on the current landscape of cybersecurity and how this company is making a difference. Hi, Glenn. How are you doing? Hey, Pri, I'm doing well. And thank you for the, uh, the invite. It's our pleasure to have you on a podcast today. So let's start uh, with telling our listeners uh, what what exactly Envision X is, what are the services it offers, and any specialization the company is into. Yeah, perfect. Um, Envision X is a first-to-market information governance, risk, and compliance platform. It's providing um, businesses both on the uh, business side and the IT side, to start to be able to make data-driven views of what critical data needs greater protections, what we call their jewels, as well as taking a full spectrum view of all their data assets of what data, which may have been useful to the company at one point in time, but over time has diminished in value and there's no legal business or regulatory reason to retain that data. And this is what we call the junk. And so our platform is allowing companies to go through um, uh, an evolution, a transformation of how to better look at their data, treat it as an asset in which some assets can be a liability and then correlate that information with its cyber controls wherever that data sits and then also look at the user behaviors to see how users are, are using that data, how are they sharing it, where else are they storing copies of it, and how are they retaining it sometimes before, beyond its useful life. That's quite impressive, Glenn. Thank you for giving such a comprehensive introduction about the company. Um, now, when we're talking about cybersecurity, I believe uh, gone are the days of simple firewalls and antivirus software uh, being your sole security measure. Now, business leaders can no longer leave information security to cybersecurity professionals. So cyber threats can come from any level of your organization as a matter of fact. Now, having said that, uh, with what mission the company was set up, can you tell us more about your company or, uh, in fact, your journey since the inception of the company? Perfect. Yeah. So, so my my journey even before starting the company, um, I'm a retired Navy commander that focused on information warfare, working with some of the biggest and some of the most critical data systems in the world. Um, was also the first chief privacy officer for LA County, and then more recently, I was a partner at Ernst and Young, leading cybersecurity and privacy for the high tech sector. Although I worked across every sector and then um, helping them build out their new information governance program. When I'm working with some of the biggest Fortune 5 companies in the world that know that they have critical data, more specifically, um, companies that that create uh, very valuable intellectual property, uh, what we call IP, it's amazing to me that the companies that create this data, the, the engineers that create this data, they don't view their company uh, assets at the same level that the cyber controls need to view the data. And often when I did uh, what we call cybersecurity or privacy program assessments 
um, without fail, um, the one factor that every company would struggle with was where is your critical data and what does it look like and who has access? And this really has come about due to the fact that those digital assets are typically created or collected by the business that helps generate value and revenue. However, um, since in, in the inception of IT, the business has often delegated um, accountability for managing and protecting those assets to either IT or to the cyber teams. But the IT and cyber teams, while they help um, with building secure applications and, and, and provide storage and help uh, enable access to the data, it's not their data. <laughs> and, and, and there is a huge chasm of what they know about critical business data versus what the business knows. And so that's why I believe that the vast majority of breaches has happened in the past and it will continue to happen going forward because most of the data protection codes controls out there, they actually do work, but it's garbage in, garbage out. And what we're doing is helping to fill that critical gap of identifying what critical data looks like, creating analytical models that are preserved and can be redeployed to the intelligence of existing cyber controls to effectively prevent the next breach. Quite impressive, uh, Glenn. Thank you for giving uh, you know your background and your role um, and your journey since inception of the company. And it's quite impressive to know that you have worked in the Navy as well. But I will come uh, to that later on um, uh, in the podcast. So you you have correctly pointed out that um, uh, cybersecurity's importance is on the rise, and fundamentally, our society is more technologically reliant than ever before. And there is no sign that this trend will slow. So data leaks uh, that could result in identity theft and now publicly posted on social media accounts are also rising. And sensitive information like social security numbers, credit card information, bank account details are now stored in cloud storage services like uh, Dropbox or probably Google Drive. So can you tell us oh, what has been your proactive role in the company and what are your contribution towards the company as well as the industry? Perfect. So um, we provide our customers a chance to to transform from being reactive firefighters, um, i.e., always responding to the uh, the breach and, and incident response, uh, which is what they become very familiar with, and some are very good at it. But by the time that they're responding, the house already burned down, and so they're minimizing the ongoing damage, but the damage has still occurred. And what we're trying to help our customers do is transform from being reactive to proactive. If they really understand where their assets are in digital format, um, whether it's in box or it's in OneDrive, or if it's on a laptop or even um, uh, some other third party application, if they know where it's at, if they know what are the data attributes that makes this data set more critical than others, it's very logical to build the models to then put the proper controls in place with the proper intelligence to monitor and protect. Okay, sounds interesting, Glenn. Um, you know, moving ahead, when you're talking about cybersecurity, uh, the restrictions imposed by governments uh, in response to the coronavirus pandemic have encouraged employees to work from home and even stay at home. So as a consequence, technology has become even more important in both our working as well as our personal lives. Now, uh, despite this rise of technology need, it is noticeable that many organizations still do not provide a cyber safe or uh, remote working environment. So where businesses uh, meetings have traditionally been held in person, now they're mostly taking place virtually and remotely and with use of different technologies and that are backed with artificial intelligence or even machine learning. So do you think that um, COVID-19 has accelerated the cybersecurity issues? And if it is, then why? Yeah, no, without a doubt, Priya. It accelerated the issues because it greatly expanded the attack surface. 
So what was a little bit better concentrated, although still very distributed uh, within the enterprise, is now every possible uh, remote location that you can think of, uh, not only working from home, but also continuing to work internationally. So uh, the uh, uh, cybersecurity has become even more challenge um, simply because the distribution of where the data that you referred to earlier is being collected and processed. How, however, I believe that just because it has been more dispersed um, doesn't mean that companies are doing this at a, at a riskier profile. If companies weren't secure uh, with remote access and, and remote um, work from home, then before, then they're, they're not likely to be more secure now because now it's going to be harder to put the genie back in the bottle. But there's some companies that had a very secure and reliable program in place well before COVID hit. So those companies are doing well. And while companies that have done it in a reactive state likely have some good controls, they liked it, didn't think through all the different threat scenarios that they needed to cover to make sure that they can do this in a secure and trusted way. Definitely. I think I uh, couldn't agree more with this. Like, yes, even I believe that uh, COVID-19 has accelerated cybersecurity issues and um, the need of uh, having a strong proof um, with government legal entities taking into uh, taking a step into this and creating a place where we are living in a soundproof uh, world with technology is quite essential. Yeah. Um, and Priya, can I, can I add one other thing that not only yeah. did um, the COVID um, increase the uh, demand for uh, more dispersed cyber controls, but if you remember, um, quite a few companies were laying off very valuable talent. So it also reduced for some companies the level of talent to manage and respond to these controls, as well as if you're laying off other talented people um, due to the substantial loss in revenue, um, these people that were at one point in time uh, trusted uh, workforce members sooner or later became an insider threat because they're now disgruntled but still have access to corporate data. So it's much more than just a dispersion. It transformed the cultural attitude for some, not all, but for some employees that felt disparaged and wanted to get um, some level of... Um, response if they're being terminated in the meantime. Yes, I think this is a very important aspect that you highlighted, Glenn, and thank you for that. But, you know, we have always been talking about uh, cybersecurity issues and COVID-19, but this different angle was never explored. And yes, that, I think that's, that's very important uh, to be honest. Like, yeah, the, the, the cultural difference and the cultural attitude, the shift in it, is is also causing um, um, an increase in the cybersecurity issues. Great. Um, so you know earlier you were talking about of uh, the junk and the jewel. So uh, can you help us, our listeners, understand that how the company is protecting the client's jewels and purging the junk? Yeah. So so most of my companies that I work with, and typically uh, Fortune 500, as I said before. Uh, they bought every particular <laughs> control under the sun. So, and they've got, they hired some of the best talent out there, both on the cyber and the privacy side, but yet the breaches keep happening. And, and what we believe, as I mentioned before, what was a critical gap was they don't know their data. So they're putting these controls in, in a manner that um, many of the controls don't require uh, the knowledge of the data Beyond in general, we know that there's critical data out there in which they're putting network security controls in place. They're putting application security controls in place. But when it comes to specific controls for data protection, like data loss prevention or cloud access service brokers, CASB, or even um, um, need to know access uh, that many hospitals and, and, and many uh, other companies uh, have put in for need to know access. If you don't know what critical data looks like, those controls do not work. And, and that's what we've been laser focused on. Uh, those three controls primarily, but not exclusively. You get those three controls to work, you will transform 
the effectiveness of those controls and reduce the risk of uh, the next cyber breach. But then on the flip side is this data, even critical data, is often co-mingled with low value data, data that is sometimes useless. And if you don't know where it's at, then it's gonna get you in trouble. But if you also start to reduce the amount of useless data that you retain, because companies are typically data hoarders and they don't delete everything. Typically they hear from legal that keep everything forever, just in case. So with our other focus is that as we identify junk data and then help them remove it, it reduces their attack surface. It makes them more operationally efficient. It reduces their compliance scope. And here's the kicker for you. It will save them millions in enterprise storage cost, in which something that most companies can't even imagine of, 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 of improving their cyber profile while also um, getting a massive ROI associated with it. That's that's quite a comprehensive solution, I would say. Where I guess uh, it's 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 all in all benefits that the enterprises are receiving in terms of cybersecurity. So hoping that um, the company is growing in future, and my best wishes for you and the company as well. Well, thank you very much, Priya, for your time, and uh, I wish you well. Thank you. So. Um, now, moving ahead, when you're talking about cybersecurity, let's not forget that cyber criminals are also becoming more sophisticated, changing what they target or how they affect organizations and their methods of attack for different security systems. Now, uh, if I want to mention, so according to the ninth annual uh, cost of cyber crime secure study from Accenture and uh, from the Ponemon Institute, the average cost of cybercrime for an organization has increased from $1.4 million over the last year to $13 million. And the average number of data breaches rose, rose by 11% to 145%. Now, clearly, information risk management has never been more important. Now, when you're talking about this, with what um, uh, intention uh, the company was set up or what makes Envision X innovative and are there any key partnerships and involvement done to drive the innovation? Yeah, so um, really I think a, a good portion of our innovative uh, perspectives have come through our, our team's um, extensive uh, operational background and consulting background as, as well as, you know, truly having an entrepreneurial spirit. I think if you take away any one of those three aspects, um, you could still be innovative, but may not be very compelling or really addressing a market need. So as I mentioned before, just seeing these issues um, compound year over year and, you know, every new cyber control comes out. But as you mentioned, the breaches are getting even more numerous. So whatever we've been doing in the past, it may have reduced some of the risk, but clearly not all the risk and it will likely to get worse. And it's getting worse because the velocity and volume of data that is being created, collected, and processed is growing much faster year over year. Um, so Gardner and IDC has, has done a, a few reports mentioning that companies are exper experiencing exponential growth of their data. So if the new growth is growing exponentially and you never address uh, the legacy data, Clearly, the data is out of control. And so until you can start to figure out how to get that data back under control, um, this is going to be a very elusive problem to, uh, to, to, to get it under control. But when you look at the innovation that we did on building the company, it was really guided by the close and trust relationships um, that we have with our customers. So we heard their problems and understanding their specific operational challenges of why this was so hard. And then we logically built and then rebuilt because we didn't get it right the first time out of the gate of how to make it easier for the data owners to be their own data analyst. So many companies have built a lot of data analytical tools, but then they require a data scientist to run them. And the data scientist needs to go back and talk to the data owners, which is ineffective and not really sustainable and very costly. 
um, or they build tools that are only run by the back end, i.e. IT or compliance. But once again, it's not their data. So sooner or later, they're going to come to some limitation of how do we do this in a more reliable and sustainable way. And so that's what our platform did. It identified we've got to make the data owner their own data analyst. We've got to be able to do this at enterprise scales, not millions of files, but tens of billions of files within a relatively short period of time. And we've got to be able to collect and connect everywhere the, the, the customer stores its data without limitation and then process it so they can consume what is in front of them and then take a data-driven response on how to either protect or to purge. Definitely. I think um, uh, uh, data is increasing every day and we all know that fact. Data is the biggest. But um, just like you mentioned that uh, we need to uh, scale up our efforts in terms of managing and processing data and making sure that we are uh, giving a transparent solution and environment to our customers so that they know what we are doing, they know where they are lacking, and probably they can take the decisions of where they, how and they want to improve. Uh, now, having all having said all this, you know, despite all the warnings and uh, high profile breaches, the state of readiness for most organizations when it comes to cybersecurity is quite average. So uh, companies are trying to uh, implement better uh, cyber hygiene uh, from using strong passwords, patching software or uh, deploying multi-factor authentication and many other important security steps. Now, while these are some basic uh, security steps that probably every organization organization should take. So do you think that cybersecurity solutions and platforms is the need of the R? And this uh, solution or platform that I'm talking about is it isn't applicable for Fortune 500 companies. So I would want to know that despite the, this basic steps that we are taking, do small businesses and medium-sized enterprises should also have a strong cybersecurity platform? Oh, absolutely. So, so every company, regardless of size, especially any company that processes um, valuable data that they want to make sure it's protected, which is is well beyond just privacy. Um, there's always something that um, every company collects and processes that they want to make sure um, stays protected. Uh, but 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 my concern, Priya, is that um, after all this time, there's still more focus on cyber controls than they are the data assets. Um, and and I don't know how else to put it, that there's not a single new control that you can build tomorrow that will stop the breaches if you don't first understand what those controls were being built to protect. So it goes keeps going back to the data. Data as an asset, if we, if we, if we equated this to a bank, it, it's, it's, it's of the knowledge, I'm gonna build the safe first then I'm going to figure out what's going to go inside the safe. That's not the way it works. And we've been trying that model for years, and they need to go back to the fundamentals that every cybersecurity framework mentions, whether it's zero trust, whether it's NIST, whether it's ISO, the first requirement is identify the critical assets. Definitely. I think that's quite important that we need to identify the critical assets and then move ahead to other uh, security steps. Uh, but one thing that um, usually, you know, uh, pops up in my mind is uh, human error. So human error, I believe, is another issue of concern. Now, prior to the pandemic, human error was already a major cause of cybersecurity. Uh, for example, employees would unknowingly or recklessly give access to the wrong people. And with home working, the problem is even greater. So when they work from home, employees may be interrupted in the work they're doing it you know, by family members or social visitors. So these distractions can make individuals or employees more careless. So I believe this is one uh, problem that probably you would have also faced. So can you tell us more about any other challenges that the company has faced and how you have overcome them? And also, like I mentioned before, like you worked at Navy. So has that experience also helped in overcoming the challenges the company has faced or probably you um, as an individual have faced? Yes, no, no, great question. So um, my Navy career and, and the level of responsibility and accountability that uh, most military personnel, not just officers, but uh, even enlisted, they're given great amount of responsibilities early on for some truly life and death 
scenarios that kind of make you grow up a little bit quicker and, and, and take true to heart some of your responsibilities to the point that you need and want to do it really well. So with my Navy background, with working at a number of different consulting firms, with also this being my fourth startup, um, I think I was well prepared to um, build a company like Envision X at this point in time and, and, and go to the journey of making this a phenomenal uh, company going forward. But, but there's always challenges. And the challenge of, 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 of dealing with um, getting the innovation right and when you think that I've got the great idea and then after you put it into play, you understand that so many other considerations must also be brought to life to make that great idea actually work for the, pro- work for the markets. But then you've got to find great talent. It's one thing starting out with your initial team, but that team needs to grow to meet the growing demands of both the company and the markets. And then lastly, you've got to have uh, substantial funding. So we've been able to find some some very trusted partners that allowed us to grow to the point that we have uh, in which we were able to close a number of Fortune 500 deals and um, are very comfortable with where the company is going forward and believe that we're going to be a, a truly strategic play for many other Fortune 500s going forward. Well, I think uh, all the elements or the aspects that uh, you mentioned are somewhere interconnected with each other. And once all of these things are sorted out, I think it can help in a proper streamline and an optimized functioning of any product or a solution of the overall company as a whole. Uh, So now this brings me to my last question, Glenn, and that would be, what are your views on the future trends of cybersecurity? I think cybersecurity um, over time will transform from being reactive to proactive. I think the accountability for cybersecurity will be better shared amongst both the business stakeholders um, and not as much relegated back to IT, cyber, and privacy. Um, And I think in many ways, cybersecurity will eventually become a competitive edge for some companies because those that do it well will understand that it can enter new markets quickly and securely while others still struggle um, to keep what they have. Couldn't agree more. Yes, I think every company should be more proactive today rather than reactive and ensure that proper policies and solutions are in place that can help them protect their organization as well as their employees. Well, uh, I believe that this pandemic has taught us that preparation is key to successfully limiting the risks related to cyber attacks. The ability to quickly react to unforeseen events helps reduce the impact of a cyber attack. The reality is that companies need to change their outlook from if they get attacked to, to when, and also recognize that the fallout from breaches of data privacy or ransomware can be financially devastating. Not to forget that financial gain is not the only motive behind cyber attacks. Hacktivism and its aim of damaging business reputation is an additional threat. Well, thank you so much, Glenn. It was a pleasure having you with us on our podcast. I think it was quite insightful. And uh, thank you for shedding light on some important aspects and different angles that were never explored. Thank you, Priya. It was a pleasure. And uh, hopefully we can do this again soon. Definitely. For our listeners, watch this space for more podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more interesting videos. Till then, stay, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you.